I'm very happy to see you here, and I myself am very happy to be here. And I'd like to explain that for a moment. All of us who are assembled here have immensely good fortune. And I would like you to consider that, because when we do consider this, gratitude arises in the heart. And when gratitude arises in the heart, the heart opens. And when it opens, we can not only understand with the mind, but also feel it with the heart. And when the Dhamma, teaching of the Buddha, can enter, and eventually, one day, we can be it, and not just be a listener or a bystander. We have immensely good fortune, because not only is this a beautiful place where there's peace and quiet and numbers of dedicated practitioners who help us to practice also but also the Buddhist teaching is alive for us it exists we have it actually at our fingertips but as I said it shouldn't remain there it should go into the heart. When, it ha when that happens, we have a feeling of inner expansion. And we have a feeling of inner joy. In a world as we have it today, and I may say have always had it, full of strife, full of competition, full of worries, full of fears. It's not easy to find absolute and utter meaning for a human life. And yet, that we all need that. We need meaning in our lives so that we know why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing, and why so often the world and its inhabitants don't seem to comply with our wishes. We have to really have an understanding of that. And we can only get that understanding when we see a meaning in life which goes far beyond everyday activities. That doesn't mean that we can't do our ev everyday activities. Obviously they have to be done. Here in this place, people cook, they garden, they clean, they sweep the pathways, they wash their clothes, just as in our place. Everybody has to do that. But what's the meaning behind all that? And I dare say you all do that too. What is the meaning behind doing all that? The meaning behind doing all that is the purification of heart and mind. And it doesn't matter what we do. I'm very fond of Teresa de Avila. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She was a um, Catholic nun in the Middle Ages. Had a really difficult time for many reasons. And she was the abbess of several different nunneries. And she gave teachings to her nuns. And one teaching I particularly appreciate, she said, I don't need another holy nun. I need one that's going to clean the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and I have often, in my mind, copied that phrase, and obviously also in my demeanor. <laughs> <laughs> Cleaning toilets is just as important as sitting on a pillow when we know why we're doing it. We're not just doing it to get them clean. That's one aspect of it, sure. Cleanliness is next to godliness, isn't it? But that's not the main reason why we're doing anything. We're doing it because, first of all, it needs to be done. And secondly, we don't expect any thanks for it. We don't expect anything except that our own heart is involved in giving ourselves 
totally to that activity, whichever it may be. And when we give ourselves, obviously, the me aspect is minimized. It becomes less because we're giving ourselves away. And this is what we notice in people who have practiced. They may not actually have verbalized it in this way. It's not necessary. It just happens that way. The meaning in our lives comes from having a higher ideal. Have something which goes beyond what I call our marketplace mentality. Obviously we need that too because the marketplace is out there. We've got to deal with it. But we only deal with it correctly when we realize that this is just one tiny little aspect of human life and the importance of a human life lies somewhere else. In the Theravadan tradition from which I come, we very often call the Buddha's teaching the path of purification. The path of purification is the name of the most famous commentary to the Buddhist teaching. That's why we often use that. Visuddhi Magga, path of purification. What do we purify? We purify heart and mind. We consist of those two things. And we can, although the Buddha used one word for both, we can distinguish. And that's quite valid. With our mind, we think, analyze, we have logical conclusions, and we try to understand. With our heart, we feel. And both have to be engaged in equal measure. Because if they're not both engaged, then we're limping on one foot. That's why I started out saying, we have so much cause for gratitude. Being here and coming near to the Buddha's teaching, the ideal that can eliminate all human problems if we make it our own. So this gratitude is a feeling of the heart. Gratitude is very near, akin to love. We can only be grateful for that, what we love. And the feeling aspect of ourselves is the one that we actually live by. We often have the idea that we live according to what we think of. But that's not so. Thinking also creates feeling. And we live according to what we feel within ourselves. The inner quality of our lives is according to our emotions. And if we want to improve the quality of our lives in any measure, it means improving, purifying our emotions. One of the mistakes that practically everyone makes is the idea that our emotions are due to the triggers that come to us from outside. What somebody says or does, what somebody doesn't do or doesn't say, a lack of appreciation, blame, all these things seem to be the cause for our unwholesome emotions. It's a mistaken view. And with that kind of view, we'll never be able to improve the quality of our lives because how much influence can we exert over other people's words and deeds? Very little, if any. The only one that we can really influence and according to the Buddhist teaching, should influence are we ourselves. And in order to do that, we need to actually think differently. When we think differently, we are different. 
eventually when we've thought it long enough. It doesn't work overnight, but it works. As far as our emotions are concerned, the Buddhist guidelines are totally clear. It's entirely up to us whether we want to follow them or not. They are so clear that they sound very easy. That can actually be confusing because it sounds so easy we are under the impression having understood it we can do it. But that's not so. The first step is understanding, certainly. But the second step, the most important step, is the experience. And the experience then has to be understood. Wisdom means the understood experience. And we have so many experiences from morning to night, every single day, that we take for granted and don't look at. And the Buddha's teaching help us to have a closer look, to understand ourselves and our daily experiences better. Because meditation must move into our daily lives, our daily thoughts, our daily activities. Otherwise, we've been sitting on the pillow in vain. Our spiritual life takes place in everyday life. When could it take place otherwise? That's the only time that it could take place. What we're doing on the pillow in the meditation is a preparation, is, the, is a skillful means in order to recognize ourselves. But then, having done so, we go out and practice. Buddhist guidelines for our emotions are called the Brahma Viharas. A Vihara is a place to live, a Pali word, and uh, we would call this Zen Center a Vihara. It's a place to live where people practice. It can be used for anything. It can be used for monastery, for a retreat center. And the Brahmas are the gods. So we translate the Brahma Viharas as the divine abidings. Well, it's a bit of an archaic expression, isn't it? We also say the four supreme emotions. And the divine abidings, that translation, doesn't mean that we have to become holy, divine, in order to practice them. Well, what it does mean is that when we practice them and have been able to practice them more and more, we can find paradise in our own heart. And that's the only place it exists. It doesn't hang around in the clouds out there. It's in our own hearts. And having found it in our own hearts, of course, happiness, joy and gratitude ensue. But this finding of the paradise in oneself has to be learned. It doesn't come by itself. I think you can easily appreciate that because, well, even if it's there, sometimes it usually doesn't stick around, does it? We have all sorts of other things having in our, uh, happening in our hearts. But the main aspect of it is that it is independent of outer conditions. Paradise cannot depend on other people because they might not be in paradise. So they take us with them to wherever they are. <laughs> it's got to be independent. And so we have the teaching which is clear and explicit and we'll have a look at that now there are four four emotions of which the Buddha said they're the only ones worth having 
Now, immediately we can see we've had a lot more than that, haven't we? <laughs> Dozens more than that. We haven't even counted them, most likely. Well, there's only four. But also we have to remember that these four depict four categories. And they have sort of undertitles. But these four are the four main emotions. Now, they're called, we translate them as, loving kindness, compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. The last one, equanimity, is one of the seven factors of enlightenment. It is called the highest emotion of all. I'm going to say something about it at this point, although it's the last one and the highest one, because usually when I start talking about the two uh, first ones, I never get to the fourth one. <laughs> so I think I'll start with the fourth one this time. Equanimity means even-mindedness. And all of these emotions have a near and a far enemy. Now, the far enemy is always very easy to understand and to recognize. The far enemy of equanimity would be worry and fear and anxiety and upset. That's no problem to see. But the near enemy of equanimity is indifference. And that's difficult to see because it's called a near enemy because it is similar. It appears to be similar. The outer manifestation of it has great similarity to equanimity. But what uh, indifference entails, it is like building a barrier around oneself. Very often we think we do that for protection. We've had bad experiences with our own emotions. We've had bad experiences with other people's emotions. Well, why shouldn't we? As long as they're not purified, there is no reason not to have unpleasant experiences with them. But we think that, very often, that if we have a sort of protective wall around ourselves, where, do you, where we don't have to come out with our own emotions, and therefore also don't have to let other people's emotions in, we'll be safe. Well, we're not. What we are, we are separated. Separated from everybody else because we've built a protective wall. A person who practices indifference, and one can practice that, feels like a bystander. He's not in it. He's not part of it. He's watching. He's observing. And if we don't allow our emotions to come out, Obviously, there's no way we can practice love and compassion. They're staying within. And if we don't practice them, we don't feel them. Love is learnable. All other the ideas to the contrary, it's learnable. So when we practice indifference, we are shutting ourselves away from that huge family of mankind where every person we meet is a, protecti a prospective beloved person and best friend. Indifference also spoils the um, possibility of practicing the Buddhist teaching in their depth. Because if we don't practice with our emotions, if we don't let them in, and eventually have trust, faith, and love, and gratitude, and reverence for the great teacher, it doesn't work. It may work intellectually, but everybody can tell the difference. The difference between what goes on in the mind and what goes on in the heart. Unfortunately, in the West, we have only been trained to use our minds. We've been trained well. We've even gone to the moon with it. We've been very, very well trained. We've found lots of um, remedies for illnesses 
we have done a lot with our minds and we've been trained since kindergarten but the training of the heart has been entirely missing the only time we would ever have got it would be as very small children at the knees of our mothers and we probably don't even remember because what we experience as very small children is hard to remember so this training of the heart of the emotions of which the Buddha speaks we now have to do as grown-ups ourselves because nobody will do it for us there aren't any institutions that are offering that as a course of study nowhere to be found the forest monastery which we're just establishing in Germany has been given the name Metta Vihara Vihara, a place to live Metta, unconditional love that doesn't mean that we are perfect it just means that we want to practice it that's all and we would like everyone who comes there to practice it these institutions that we have are worthwhile for the training of the mind for making a living for being able to use our minds in useful ways but the heart is having a back seat so this is actually one of the most important aspects of the practice of the Buddha's teaching to develop our capacity our heart capacity now all of us have it we all have the heart quality and the heart capacity for love and compassion and at one time or another I dare say we've all felt it equanimity as opposed to indifference contains all the other three supreme emotions love, compassion and joy with others but it is mentioned at the fourth place because of the fact that we need to develop the other three in order to get to equanimity to even mindedness can you for a moment imagine how wonderful it is to have equanimity even in situations which are life threatening a real practitioner should and would be able to do that because there are all sorts of other understandings and feelings than that particular threat the threat is nothing it's love com and pa compassion that are uppermost so when equanimity has arisen the other three have also arisen that's why only equanimity is mentioned as one of the seven factors of enlightenment we can practice equanimity and actually in the Buddhist teaching the main thing is to practice whatever we can do now we have practiced even walking as a small child we had to practice again and again and if you've watched a small child they fall down and they get up and walk again and hang on somewhere and now we walk as a matter of course we had to practice eating we had to practice going to the toilet we had to practice reading and writing it's all a matter of course now the same goes for this we have to practice equanimity until it becomes a matter of course but equanimity has one other facet other than those three emotions it has the facet of insight of insight into the impermanence the constant change the flowing like a stream of all human endeavor and all human beings and that kind of insight that kind of 
true understanding of what is called in Pali Anicca impermanence as one of the three characteristics in the world that provides one with the feeling of just flowing with whatever is happening without trying to hang on. When we try to hang on, we can never have equanimity because nothing that happens is unchangeable. Whether it's we ourselves, whether there are situations or feelings or thoughts, whether it's what we like or we don't like, whether what we think we must have or must get rid of, all of it changes constantly. At this point, I usually recommend that when you get home, take out an old photo album, the oldest you can find. And if you haven't got it, get your mother to give you the oldest one that she has, where you might be lying on a little bare skin and underneath it says your name or your age, one month old. And then hold that up against the mirror and then look at yourself. <laughs> and then turn the pages. There you are going to school, getting bigger, playing soccer or something, and uh, maybe university, graduating, getting married, and then hold up those pictures against the mirror and then say to yourself, that's me, this is me, which one's me? And of course you haven't got a photo of every situation in your life. So one can probably safely say that there have been at least 1,000 changes since you appeared on this planet. Which one's me? Everyone's me. Well, that's nice. 1,000 me's. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to feed that many me's, isn't it? <laughs> but it does give one an optical view of impermanence which can be extremely helpful to make it clearer what it means. It means that there is not only the change from photo to photo, but there is the change from moment to moment. If you have one of those digital clocks, watch it for a minute or two, and you can see time as we know it, is running away. And when you see that really, truly, deeply, you might do what I often recommend. Remember that this is the first day of the rest of your life. What do you want to do with it? Get out a little notebook and a pen and write your priorities in and look at them. What do you really want to do? Go to the beach? Have a trip to India? Is that going to be one's life's ambition? See the children well established? Have as many holidays as possible? What does one want? Try to figure it out. Nobody can tell you. But this is the first day of the rest of your life. A human life, according to the Buddha's teaching, is extremely precious. It's difficult to come by. There's a story. The Buddha went for a walk with his monks along the beach. And he said to the monks, imagine that there is a blind turtle swimming around in the oceans of the world. And there's also a wooden yoke swimming around in the oceans of the world. Now that blind turtle comes up for air once every hundred years. Do you think that when she does that, she could put her head through that wooden yoke? And the monk said, no, it's impossible. They could be in the same place at the same time. And the Buddha said, it's not impossible. It is 
unlikely but it's not impossible and the same he said applies to being born a human being with all one's senses intact and on top of that being able to hear the true Dhamma we've got this extremely fortunate situation and I dare say that we often take it for granted if we don't immense gratitude will arise that we are in this position and another thing will arise a feeling of responsibility a feeling of responsibility towards our surroundings the people around us as you all know our new physics are telling us that there are no observers there are only participants we have all experienced that that we are participants if you sit in a room and a person comes in very angry doesn't say a word it's just angry you can feel it if you sit there long enough you might also get angry angry about the fact that the other person is angry no words need to be exchanged if you sit in a room and a person comes in very loving compassionate you can feel it and after a while that kind of feeling might enter into your heart we take part in everybody else's feelings and emotions so when we realize how extremely fortunate we are in this lifetime this sense of responsibility develops that our own feelings are available to other people and should therefore be purified and helpful not only to ourselves which of course they are but also to others we're not practicing only for ourselves we're practicing for everybody else around us the Buddha said a person who meditates is of great benefit to their clan a person who gains insight is of great benefit to their whole village or even to many villages and an enlightened person is of great benefit to the whole world so whatever we do everybody else is participating that sense of responsibility is one which creates within us urgency in Pali that's some vega one step one of, one of the steps of insight the urgency to get on with it to get on with what? with the purification of our heart so that whatever flows out of our heart adds to the beauty of the universal consciousness to which everyone has access but we don't have access to universal consciousness as far as our own consciousness has already been developed we can't access enlightened consciousness because we haven't got it but we can certainly get in touch with angry consciousness we've got that we can get in touch with envious consciousness but we can also get in touch with loving consciousness if we, if we develop it in ourselves so if you remember and I hope you do that this is the first day of the rest of your life and then try to figure out what's the meaning of my life what's the most important thing to do and write it down and then look again at it after two weeks and see if it's still the same or whether you want to change something it's immensely helpful in making this life meaningful when it has that kind of depth of meaning joy arises automatically because we know why we're doing what we're doing
I'll get back to the first two emotions now. The first one in Pali Metta, M-E-T-T-A, is usually translated as loving kindness. But I like to translate it as unconditional love, impersonal love. And that's actually its meaning. It's not what we understand love to be. Our movies and our novels have given us a false impression. But it's not only that. It's also our ego consciousness which has given us a false impression of what love really is. When we hear the word, we most people immediately think that a partner is meant. Well, if we were meaning that, we would say partner love, wouldn't we? We are, the Buddha said, if the Dhamma has to be spoken very explicitly. So we don't mean partner love. That's also possible. But that's what we think of when we hear the word love. Or we think of the love in a family. Or particularly to one, two or three people. And as we think of love in that way, we obviously practice it in that way. And as we practice it in that way, it is a kind of love which has fear in it. It's a fear of loss. And fear goes under the category of hate. We don't hate the people. We hate the idea that they can be lost. Every mother knows that fear. It's totally clear to each mother. And most mothers don't know what to do with it other than have it and um, express it. But everybody else has it too. Because we are under the mistaken impression that we can only love one, two, three, four people. Well, obviously that can't be true, can it? There are six billion of us on this planet. So if there's only one, two, three or four that we can love, what a limitation we put upon ourselves. And not only that, having fear imbued with that, we never get to know what love actually means because it's always hampered by this feeling this may stop and then we are of the opinion that love stops but love has in reality nothing to do with another person love is the quality of our hearts it is the only quality next to compassion that we need to develop everything else is only a bother as we all know it's a hindrance to develop love is not difficult but most people never think of it we are under the impression and it has been said many times that love to love somebody and somebody to love us that's good luck so if this lucky situation should not be forthcoming we'll have to be without love does that make sense that's what people think but when you hear it verbalized like that can you realize how little sense that makes why do we have to be without love just because nobody has come around to tell us how wonderful we are I mean, if somebody does come around and tell us that that's nice, wonderful, nice for them, but what does that do for us? <laughs> the main thing that it does for us is that we remain in the mistaken impression that there has to be somebody that thinks we're lovable and also that there has to be somebody that we think is lovable. Now, if you think for a moment about yourself, are we totally lovable? Only an arahant, an enlightened one, is totally lovable. 
and we wouldn't recognize him anyway because we don't know what it's like to be totally enlightened. So maybe he, we would think, oh, he's uh, not very friendly or something. <laughs> Possible. So it has nothing to do with being lovable because if we wait for that, for perfect lovable, we can wait many lifetimes. Love is there to be developed in the heart and to be given out as a gift without any wish or determination to get something in return. It's just a gift. And when we look at it in that way, we have a chance, a chance to practice it and a chance to develop it. Now, the practice of it goes on from morning to night. Everybody meets people. Now, we don't have so much difficulty with loving puppy dogs or flowers or um, beautiful clouds in the sky. They don't talk back. So, that's not so terribly difficult. And we can practice with that. It's all right just to get a beginning going. But what we really need to practice with are the people whom we meet in daily life, from morning to night. And some of them may be not looking the way we expect them to look, not talk the way we expect them to talk, not be the way we expect them to be. But that's only our expectation. Are our expectations justified? Why should we live by our own expectations? Expectations are always coupled with disappointments. They belong together. So that is best discarded. Nobody is the way we think they ought to be. It's not possible because we've made up a sort of an idea. They're always supposed to be smiling, they're supposed to love us, they're supposed to appreciate us, they're supposed to never do anything that we wouldn't do. I mean, where can you find people like that? <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we close our hearts we're friendly sure and polite certainly but that real flowing of the heart quality the warmth of the heart that we don't practice and that if we practice it even a little while it gives a great sense of security most people feel very insecure in this world, rightly so. Death is imminent and disaster is always possible. But when we practice the heart quality of love, the security which we feel comes from the fact that we know how we're going to react in every given situation. It may be as unpleasant as it wants to be. We don't have to fall into the trap of responding with unpleasantness. We have trained ourselves to love that which is happening, particularly with people. So from morning to night, we have what we call a kamatana, a working ground. Other people, they're there. For instance, the postman brings the mail. We happen to be there, and he brings the mail. Do we feel anything? Or are we only intent to see what's in the mail? Or do we have any interest in that person? Or we go to a supermarket, and the cashier is t giving us the bill. What do we think about it? So much money to pay? Or um, I wonder if she made a mistake? Or... What do we think? Anything of love and compassion towards the person that we have just dealing with? The mind, which is called a magician, can do anything and will probably tell us if we ask for the reason why we're not feeling love. And that person has nothing to do with me. It's uninteresting. That's not true. That person is our partner at the moment that we are dealing with that person. We call it impersonal love 
because we like to develop that feeling not dependent on people which doesn't mean that we can't love the people that belong to our family on the contrary we can love them much better because we are no longer trying to hang on the far enemy of love is obviously hate that's easy but the near enemy is affection and attachment I already explained that because it breeds fear fear of loss when we have fear of loss we live with fear in our life and when we live with fear we can never be without stress and pressure unfortunately most of humanity lives that way we are fearful of many things but this particular one is present in many lives then not to say that we can't use the love in a partnership as a seed bed at least we know what it feels like to be there for another person and to not put oneself in first place but maybe have the other person as equally important and the warmth of the heart going out to that person but it's only a seed bed if we use it to expand it it's been used properly if we don't use it we limit ourselves more and more that limitation is then also the limitation of our horizon and the horizon stays the way it's always been it stays with the everyday activity with the market marketplace mentality and when we have that kind of horizon there is that little feeling nudging our heart there must be more to life than that and I dare say that's why you're here there is more to life than that but it has to happen within ourselves nobody can make it happen for us the Buddha called himself a shower of the way you know you have a map where it says where to go well if you don't go the best maps useless so he showed us the way he showed us the way how to purify and improve the quality of our heart so that that warmth that we all have in it can flow unhindered it flows easy it doesn't have any particular destination it just flows you can compare it to intelligence in the mind if we are intelligent we can solve mathematical problems probably but the intelligence doesn't disappear when there are no mathematical problems to be solved it remains with us it's the same with love it's always there and as we have it always in the heart it is a grounding it is a centering only that can be a grounding only that can be a centering and the more we develop it and the more it is joined with the understanding of impermanence the more equanimity we realize and when there's equanimity there's nothing to worry about there's no strife no stress no pressure we're often under the opinion of the opinion that the stress and the pressure that we have are due to outside conditions I can assure you we put all that on ourselves a loving heart doesn't feel pressure what can be pressuring it somebody may be unpleasant well that's all right the loving heart doesn't change things don't work the way they're supposed to well they usually don't don't do that 
But what does that do to a loving heart? Nothing. It just remains the way it was. That's why it's called impersonal love. It's also called unconditional love. Unconditional means that we don't put conditions on the people, that we will only love them if. And we've got a whole list of ifs. There's no if. They are our working ground. And you can start with that working ground today. This is the time. There is no other time. This is another important realization that comes with practice. That the only time we have is now. The past is irrevocably gone. The future has not yet come. And when it actually comes, it's called the present. Tomorrow never appears. When it appears, it's today. So all we have is this moment. It's actually a wonderful feeling of ease. One doesn't have to worry about the next 20 years. It's a foolishness to do that. Or even the next two years. All we have to think about is loving and understanding this present moment. This one, which is already gone, and there's a new one. And when we do that, we're eliminating practically every problem we have. We don't need somebody else to solve our problems for us. If we live in this present moment only, right now, no problems. That doesn't mean one can't plan. Having done so, planning, that's done now. But then we have to let go of it and live this moment. And if we live this moment, we can love this moment. So it's not only people. It's a situation we love. It's nature. We can love the Buddha for his great teaching. We can love the Dhamma, which teaches us. We can love the people who practice it. We can love the person sitting next to us because that person is supporting our own practice. There are so many opportunities to love. Unfortunately, in this world of ours, people take every opportunity they have to dislike. It's a choice. It doesn't mean when we love that we, do, that we no longer see the feelings and the fallacies which happen. It has nothing to do with it. Loving doesn't mean that we become totally blind. It just means our warmth of response. That's all. We do not approve of the criminal act, but we can still love the criminal. And when we've learned to do that, we've learned an enormous lesson. And every single person that is able to do that, every single one that can do that, brings more love into the world. And with that, more peace. I know we would all like peace out there. We never get it unless we have it inside of us. We are the peacemakers, each one of us. This is a responsibility we have. Love in the world depends upon the love that each one of us is able to arouse in their own heart. Peace in the world is totally dependent upon the peace we can arouse in our own heart. A loving heart can become peaceful. A heart without love can never be peaceful. It can be indifferent, but not peaceful. So if we would like, like so many people would like, to improve the world, it's not so difficult. 
if we improve ourselves. And that has not only been the Buddha's teaching, that has been the teaching of all the great masters that we've ever had. How do we improve ourselves? Just in this way, by recognizing what goes on within us. Recognition is facilitated through meditation. Meditation then becomes the means for recognizing ourselves. I'm afraid in order to keep to the schedule, the other two great emotions will have to come at another time. <laughs> and I think the time has come to have a break, doesn't it? Okay.